Thanks for having me. I'm honored. I'm humbled to be here. My starting point, I have two starting points. Um, so the question here is, of course, who, is, who are the agents of disruption? Is it private actors or can it be the state? Right? Should it be the state? Should it be the private actors? Should it be both? Right? So that was so the, the opening question. But my starting point is twofold. One is I see a curious creation, translation, implementation gap, especially in, say, climate change, but also in other, other areas, um, th that despite ambitious state funding from R&D, the generated results do not adequately make their way into national and international policies, mainly because national and international politics get in, gets in the way. Um, and one of the most glaring examples here would be the gap between climate science, climate policies, and climate diplomacy. But you can find other, other uh, areas um, where this clash is. The reasons for this gap are institutional path dependencies, institutional inertia, bureaucratic processes, and risk aversion in R&D funding. And you can find other, um, other reasons probably too. So that's my first starting point. The second starting point is historical. Because if you look into the historical sources, you'll find that there's so many examples where the, the frustration on the political level outweighs the perceived benefits of science diplomacy. So I'm interested in uh, what I call uh, underperforming science diplomacy projects uh, or large-scale state-led S&T initiatives that tried and failed to incorporate international private research power. And then if I look into the history, I think two examples really stand out. You can find others, but the two that fascinate me the, the most is, first, the restructuring of European science organizations in the 1970s, and the second is America's SDI, or Strategic Defense Initiative, in the 1980s. So in the 1970s, the practice of European S&T was fragmenting European science into distinct, but sometimes overlapping and competing functionally specialized multilateral science organizations, organizations like CERN, like uh, the Southern Observatory, or like uh, ESRO and others. And this was seen at the beginning of the 1970s by the German government under Chancellor Brandt uh, as being historically understandable, but ultimately not very efficient and very unstrategic project-driven integration that at the end of the day didn't even help along European integration. And this is why we started European, the Europeanization of science. So then the question arose, how should it be restructured or reframed so that it would become a sort of uh, a, a support beam for European integration? Um, and how could it still protect European technological autonomy, especially from the United States? So you have the compet competition element here. The second example would be the SDI in the 1980s. So when the Reagan administration launched SDI in 1983, there was hope in the German government, by that time under Chancellor Kohl, the conservative, uh, that German industry would be able to attract significant amounts of R&D funding from America. So there was a hope there would be more cooperation and less competition. Uh, but ultimately, similar to what happened most recently, say, with the CHIPS Act, but you can find other examples too, protectionist impulses prevailed, cutting out almost all international private actors. And this led to a lot of frustration in the government, uh, in the German government, and you can see it in the sources, they're quite eloquent. Um, and the frustration, so Chancellor Kohl's called, called this a big disappointment, but only behind closed doors because it didn't want to openly criticize the Reagan administration. But that is despite, and this is what makes it interesting, this government was very pro-American and it had a very intimate relationship with NASA in its own space program. Yeah? But still there was not enough cooperation. So I think these are quite interesting underperforming um, R&D or S&T initiatives. So then, how can private know-how and research cultures and private funding be put to work for the greater good? I see today there's a change, a switch, that can be observed in international R&D cooperation managed by ministries of technology, away from input orientation, so that's funding and regulation, towards output orientation, solving predetermined, predefined, concrete problems. And these are hard problems, like put a man on the moon, cure cancer. And that, I think, is a big, is a big shift in S&T. Um, but it's important because ministries try to sort of preserve their ability to steer and guide research. And this is why, why we're doing this. And that's my perspective in the, in the case study, too. My perspective is one of the Ministry of Research and Development, or Research and Technology. I understand that this 
uh, the switch from input to output orientation sort of was possible because of the emergence of financially potent private research actors. And that's something that sets today apart from, say, the 1970s. I understand that. Take AI as an example. So I see today a spectrum of possible collaborative structures in S&T, and this is the model here. That's historic, sort of a, it's a historic, it's not a model, it's a historically informed heuristic um, to try to sort of understand how collaborative structures can look like. Um, and then the second question is, well, what is the best one if we want to preserve a lot of the benefits, but also try, try to prevent a lot of mistakes that have been made in the past? And I see this really as a spectrum. So on the one side, on the left side, international science organizations are sort of the remit, the exclusive remit, say, of governments. And on the other side, private actor-led research fields are, um, these are fields where the private actors are in the driver's seat. So international science organizations like, say, nuclear fusion, um, in, in these areas, and these are super expensive research areas, the state provides all the funding and through specialized agencies also the direction of research. Multilateral settings make these decision processes cumbersome and bureaucratic, however. This can produce front frontier research, but tends to lead to an early lock-in of particular technology. So it's not technology open, it's not flexible in that sense. That might not be the most suited to the problem. Right? So a particular reactor technology, a particular kind of particle accelerator or telescope or whatever. So state influence, very high. Private actor influence, very low. Competition, very low. Cooperation, very high. So on the other side, then, private actor-led research fields that outpace state regulation are fields on the other side of the spectrum where the state has fallen behind the regulatory curve, so to say. Here, different technologies can be tried out and the competitive mindset of private industry competing for the best technological solutions leads to a technology openness and almost no state interference. So there's flexibility and there's speed. But there aren't many incentives to share the fruits of R&D, say transparency, communication. So state influence very low, private actor influence very high, competition very high, cooperation low. So there's a few problems there too. So now, this is why I think in the middle, that's where the sweet spot lies. And I would call these, uh, in, um, these areas innovation ecosystems, or these collaborative structures I call innovation ecosystems, and a great case study is space. So innovation ecosystems try to prevent some of the problems and combine a lot of the benefits mentioned above. Less bureaucratic processes, primacy of private R&D with strong elements of competition, state steering through funding and regulation that guarantees that R&D has a particular direction and prevents, say, unethical R&D. And then state funding now and long-term state contracts in the future serve as incentives for public and private actors to come together in these collaborative ventures and regulation can help spread research findings and technologies. Right? So that's the hope that the findings that will then be spread out and the technologies will also, also spread out. So this is why I think uh, innovation ecosystems are the, sort of the superior um, of the three. State influence, medium. Private actor influence, high. Competition, high. But cooperation, also high. Yeah, so this, and I think this is how I would define the sweet spot. So in conclusion, S&T ecosystems need to be designed in a way to, for them to be as open, inclusive, and international as possible. Right? We're talking about science diplomacy. It has an international element. So as to prevent S&T protectionism and improve the international and transnational S&T integration that is the backbone of science diplomacy. Open S&T ecosystems are the most promising avenue to generate disruption and spread the benefits of innovation widely. They could also be a way to help inform S&T policies, thus making the policy-making process more technocratic and more immune from purely political considerations like protectionism. But, and that's a big but, it needs a different science diplomatic practice uh, for these hopes to be uh, fulfilled. Um, so, Ministries, uh, be it the Foreign Office or be it ministries for, of research and technology, they need to create inclusivity, not organizations, right? They need to organize uh, flexibility, not rigidity. And this requires sort of a different mindset and a, and a change in diplomacy for science. But at the same time, science for diplomacy, um, co collaboration will improve national reputation and national S&T systems. And so that still, so that still sort of works. But I think the primary responsibility lies with the state actors to make these, to bring about these innovation ecosystems. Thank you.